Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the ODI. My name is Anna Scott. I'm the Head of Content and today I'm delighted to introduce for the last ODI Fridays of the year our very own Dr. Dave Tarrant for a Christmas-themed, IoT-themed Friday lunchtime lecture. If you're on the live stream, uh, the hashtag is ODI Fridays, so if you have any questions you can ask with the hashtag at the end and we'll be sure to ask Dave for you. Um, otherwise, I'll pass over. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, everyone who's watching online live, uh, everyone who might be across our node network as well. Uh, and good afternoon to those of you in the room. It's very great for you to, for you to join me today for this kind of Christmassy, fun-themed lecture, which I'm hoping it's going to be a little bit. I tried to put something a bit wacky in at the end of the year. Um, so what are we going to look at today? Uh, there's your topics, which are on Christmas lights in an automated home. And the place I'm going to start is where... Uh, most, it, most of us might have heard of these devices. I put in the invite for this to you know, ask the various devices to book you a place. So we're going to have a look at the three different environments that there are, the big ones that are out there for automating and, uh, your home. Um, and I would say, as a warning at the start, if you've got any of these, before I start saying their activation words, especially for those of you listening online potentially through one of them, you know, just be aware that I will be saying the activation words throughout this lecture and it might set things off. You have been warned. Okay? Same for anyone in the room who's got a device that might get set off. So, I'm going to have a look at Apple's HomeKit, have a look at Alexa, there's the first one, okay? and have a look at Google Home as the starting point for this. Um, before I begin, I have to say a big, big thank you to the, obviously the online community who help out a lot with this, but especially this mad guy here who does a lot of really good smart home videos about reviewing different products. And he always has his dog Monty. This is a real dog, okay, that sits there during the whole video that he interacts. It's, it's, it's kind of mad. But uh, so thank you very much to Aaron for a, a lot of the inspiration for this. So let's have a look at the agenda that we're going to try and get through today. We're going to have a look at ba the basics of what are the environment's like and which ones are the best ones. And then what can we do with them that goes further. So this is our um, agenda for today that I'm going to try and get through. Okay, all the way to a fundamental problem with all of them and potential solutions. Uh, and I've also got a couple of demos which I hope to show in the room, so we'll cross our fingers and hope technology works around this. Now, if you don't want to spoil the outcome of all of these points, so to which one wins, please close your eyes now, okay, because the next slide has the too long didn't read outcome on it. Three, two, one. Right, let's move on, okay? <laughs> okay, so now you've, you've seen what the outcome is, but let's explain that. Um, so let's go first with setup. Okay, so when I'm talking about setup, right, you get a device, we get some kind of home automated light or whatever it might be, and we want to bring it up to work with these systems. Um, so let's take a look first at Apple. Apple, one step. Really important, and I cannot say how significant this is in their ecosystem. The fact that you buy a device, you get a box for that device, it's got a code on it, okay, you scan that code, and it works with your system. Just one step, that's all you do. Alexa, seven steps. Google Home, six steps. Okay, so this is a big challenge straight away for buying lots of home automated devices or whatever you're trying to link up to these systems. You've got a hell of a lot of steps to get through. And they have a big implication on how you use them and what and, and, and a big implication on everything else I'm going to be talking about. So I want to start here. So here's that example of Apple. You simply pull the phone out of your pocket or whatever the device is, scan the accessory code, and it does all of the negotiation directly with the accessory, adds it, and you're done. One step. Simple as can be. Moving on to Alexa, the seven steps are, well, firstly, when you've got the device, you have to download the manufacturer's app. Now, this is significantly different from Apple, where you use their own app. You're in their own ecosystem, you use the Apple Home app, and you don't have to download a third-party one. So you download the manufacturer's app, link gadgets to your Wi-Fi, install gadget in the app you've just downloaded. That normally involves signing up with the manufacturer and their web service. Okay? Um, then you have to open the Alexa app, which is a different app, find the manufacturer's skill within that app, and then add it as a skill in order for it to work. So this is the one device to getting it working with Alexa, seven complete steps. And as you can see, the, one of the big problems with this is we've created another ecosystem for where those skills are found. So this is like a skills store. It's not an app store, it's a skills store. And as you can see, people are not too happy about them actually working. Those reviews are shockingly low for something that should be uh, simple to work, especially when you consider Philips Hue, one of the big brands that's out there that's been in this space a long, long time. But still, some shockingly low reviews for you know, people having real problems getting the skills working and the challenges with Alexa. So as I say, seven steps. Any one of these has a the potential to go a little bit wrong, and then you don't know, you know where you've got to and, and what to do next. 
And just to emphasize how that works then, um, typically with a lot of these systems, you have the app that connects to the device and can control it, be it a light bulb or be it whatever. Um, in order for it to work with Alexa, down in our bottom left-hand corner, we have to connect that to a web service. That web service can then also control the device. Okay, so you don't need to fire up the app, you tell Alexa and it does it. Um, and then, but what you need to do that is obviously then connect it to an Alexa skill and that finally connects to Alexa. So that's kind of a diagrammatic version of how that works. And again, I'm going to come back to this ecosystem and, 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 and outline why there are maybe some good things in here, but there's some, definitely some challenges for consumers. Google Home, six steps are very similar to the Amazon set, to the Alexa set, apart from the fact you don't do the last bit and just connect it to the web service and it connects it to Google Home. Now, one of the main problems with Google Home, which is why unfortunately I'm almost going to drop it at this point, is that it's another device by Google which doesn't have the greatest level of support for devices out there currently. It doesn't really support everything within the Nest portfolio. And it's not as if Google owned Nest or anything. You know, uh, so it's another one of these devices where I would say that if you are a Google person, it's kind of an early adopters thing. Okay? I mean, it's not as if Google have got a, a huge track record either of releasing products to the market that become really successful. Uh, let's take, well, I don't know, Google Wear, Google Glass. I'd put Home in the current same category currently at the moment. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to do quite a lot of things with Google Home without really, you know, um, a lot of effort. Um, so even though it's only six steps, um, there's still a lack of, of support amongst the devices for Google Home. So just coming back, I just want to emphasize this point very clearly about how HomeKit kind of simplifies all that. You scan the code, it controls the device. That's it one step. It's so simple. It's so easy. Um, partly because, okay, Apple control that sort of ecosystem. They've set such a demand on the manufacturers as to what they have to support in order to be in their ecosystem. But it does come with some benefits to the users, clearly, uh, in this kind of uh, situation. So in terms of setup then, for me, Apple wins it. One click, literally, to get set up. Um, so let's go on to the next one, apps. So apps, let's start with Apple again. Apple uh, obviously have the home app. Now this is where you add the devices, so this is where they appear. And again, that's the major significant thing here. Um, and this is an absolute great thing for people to look at the, the dashboard of their home. This is my home. This is actually what it looks like when I have the, the iPad sitting on the wall with all the lights and everything that's kitted out with it. Okay, so this was last night. I took a screenshot of it. And as you can see, it gives you that instant feedback on what's on, what's off, light levels, etc. And, and everything is there as one easy snapshot. Tap a button, on, off, etc. It's really, really simple. Is that like a direct whiskey lid? Um, there's a whiskey cabinet, basically. Yeah. Yeah, turn whiskey on. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, with the other ones, um, obviously you get this kind of issue because they don't provide an app. They're, they're more about the talking. They're more about the voice interface. So in terms of the apps, this is uh, a screenshot I took of an Android phone running all of these various different apps that you could have for all the various different services. And again, one of the problems with this is at the moment you've got, you've got different services for different kind of things, like Hive is for your water and electric, which is kind of easy to understand. But as soon as you get into the range of having lots of things that control bulbs, you've got to walk into a room and remember what brand of bulb you've got in the ceiling in order to work with it using an app, find out whether it's on or off or not, etc. This is massively confusing, surely. There's just huge, huge amounts of confusion there. Um, but again, back in the Apple, it's all there. It's a consistent interface. I'm not saying it's the best interface, and I'm not saying it's the easiest to use. I think they've got a lot of improvements to do for this. But again, one place where it exists. Great, lovely, thanks very much. So um, I'm afraid on that point, Apple wins that one as well for the generic user. So that's, that's unfortunately too, Neil. Automation, let's move on. Um, automation, now let's go back to Apple's ecosystem again. You might have noticed it by now. It's down here. There's a red arrow. There it is. There's a button that says automation on the bottom of the app. Sorry if you can't see that. You press the button and it comes up with your automation screen. And now you can add automations. Um, again, these are mine, based upon turning things on or off or not. And there's a when I arrive home automation, such that if I've got two bags of heavy shopping or something, you know, the, the lights turn on, for example, um, which is quite nice. But again, it's in the app. Um, one of the things that I don't like about it at the moment is it doesn't do very well with integrating with third-party accessories like sensors. So you can't say, when this happens, trigger this event. That, you, there's barely any support for that within the Apple ecosystem at the moment. You know, easy to configure, but there is a few frustrations around well, if I've got a sensor or if I've got a door lock or if I've got things that are trigger points, they're very difficult to, to work with within the Apple ecosystem. So again, massive improvements that can be made. 
Let's have a look at Alexa. I said I'm dropping Google Home. It's very similar, but I'm going to carry on with the Alexa ecosystem. Uh, so I said about you have the app, you have the web service, you have the Alexa skill. And as you saw from when we were talking about the apps, each app might be from a different manufacturer, which means you need a different web service, which means you need another skill, which means it scales this way again in terms of the number of these web services that you might be using from different manufacturers. And in order to do automation with these, you have to link them to these kind of services, like if this, then that, and Stringify, which are definite programmer interfaces. You know, the, the, the web services you might have seen online, you click a button, you might be able to string them together, but it's not that user friendly for a generic in the house user. You know, um, so again, you can do it, but it's not that obvious, you know, how to make these things work nicely across all of these web services. Very powerful and flexible, but at the same time, that brings complexity and, and a lack of understanding of users. So again, we go back to, unfortunately, this whole idea of, well, it's there. It just works within this kind of ecosystem where you've got one thing talking to all the devices. And, and that just makes it easy. So I'm, I'm afraid we're not doing too well here. We're on three now. Um, let's go on to privacy and security. And this is a big one. We talk about this a lot at the Open Data Institute. Uh, and so I want to talk about it a bit here as well within these ecosystems. Now, to understand the privacy and security of each of these when you talk to them and where your voice goes, you know, what they want to do, uh, the best thing to do is to look at their business models to work out, well, why would they want to capture and have a voice interface? Okay? So if we look at Apple's basic business model, it's buy our overpriced hardware. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's suited for you or not. We will make it pitch so that such that you actually want to buy it, regardless of whether it suits what you need. Okay, that's kind of Apple's business model right there. Okay, um, Amazon, more kind of buy things fast. Okay, we want recommended, get into our, buy it. There we go. We've recommended the thing that you want in our ecosystem, post it on your Facebook feed. You need that thing, get it from us fast, like in two hours. You know, this is where Amazon's coming from. The faster that they can make us buy things, the better. Google, based upon your history, look at this kind of thing. You know, they're, they're a search provider. They're about providing better search results for us. And so these two, as you can see, are definitely based upon processing something of our data as opposed to just going, well, we just produce lots of expensive stuff that you're going to want to buy anyway. Okay. Um, so you can see instantly there that there's likely to be some different business models around what data they want to collect off of you. So, but let's also look at the hardware. Now, Apple started in this ecosystem with the Apple TV as the hub, the thing that would sit in your house and talk to all of those devices. Okay, that was the thing that they started with. Then they enabled it on the iPad in terms of actually talking to things. And that's a significant difference because we're not talking about, um, we're not literally talking to the device yet. When they started this kind of ecosystem, that was something later. It was, first of all, it was, well, let's just make all the devices so that we can have that app. Right, and then we'll think about how we control that app later. Of course, with the other two, I've got the Amazon Echo here. With the other two, it's the speaker and microphone idea. You know, you shout at this thing, okay, and it does things for you. So it, it, from this very start, it was about voice interaction. Okay, and that, again, has a significant difference on, uh, on, on the outcome of these and how they work. Um, but if you actually then, uh, and, and the, you know, that, that's the same in terms of, you can see here that the Apple TV acts as the hub within the house and talks directly to the devices. In order for these things to all talk together, you can see that in order for, to talk to this device, you have to be in the cloud, in the web to start with, right? In order for it to translate what you say back into what you mean to go all the way back to your house to control the device. You know, you're already using the web services. So actually, with the Apple TV connected to an app, you didn't need to be online. You just connect directly to the device within your own house. So there's a little bit on privacy and security. Again, if you don't want to use the voice interface, you don't have to, which is quite nice. Um, but then you can look at their kind of security, uh, privacy and security documents around well, what they actually do. So let's look for clarification within this. So this is the iOS HomeKit um, security section of the document. And what's quite nice about this is it tells you how it works tells you how it does the encryption, tells you how it talks with the devices at what point. It's all very clear about this is what we, we enforce upon all the manufacturers and all the people who have to talk to our HomeKit devices, is that it works like this. Interestingly, Amazon don't tell you necessarily how they make it work. What they do is they enforce things like privacy requirements onto people who build those web services, right? which is interesting because there's phrases in here like you must not misuse identifiable information, which is very subjective. You know, what is misuse? One person's misuse is another person's brilliant use of data, etc. So there's, you know, very kind of woolly in terms of it. And it uh, this is on the requirements of those people who want to enter into the ecosystem. I couldn't actually find anything on the ecosystem itself. 
which was interesting. Um, and I've looked around, and hence why I've watched all those videos, to find out whether that's true or not. But then this was very easy to find. You just type in HomeKit sec security and privacy, and it comes up as top Google search, which is great. That much harder. Lots of developer documentation. And so one of the other things that I wanted to emphasize about this is because of that whole using web services to do everything, it's effectively, if you went into your own house and asked your Echo to you know, turn some lights on, you're effectively broadcasting that, it would seem to me, into the web and back again. You know, I've told Amazon now that I'm home effectively, because I've interacted with it. It doesn't matter if, the intera if they don't record the interact, if they don't record what the interaction actually was, they've recorded the fact there was an interaction, probably, which is interesting. Um, and I put this picture up because of the fact that uh, somebody, uh, you can get smart door locks. Don't know if anyone's brave enough to get one of them. I certainly am not. Um, smart door locks, and this is basically a guy who's forgotten his house keys and he's just shouting at the echo to let him in. You know, hey, um, hey Alexa, open the front door, right? Because the speaker's permanently located probably in the living room. So just be, just be aware of that one. If you're ever considering getting a front door lock, make sure that you can't activate it by shouting through your letterbox. Okay, a little bit of a security flaw. Okay, um, yes, that has happened. So on this one, I'm afraid we're up at four in, in terms of where we're at at the moment, in terms, uh, in terms of the, the transparency of that and the privacy and security of it. Let's go on to remote access. So this was the bit where Apple then added the whole idea of the cloud for remote access. They added the idea of, okay, so you can link your home kit into iCloud and you can share it with your... Um, um, share it with people in your house and uh, etc. Uh, they've had a recent security flaw in that um, in the last couple of weeks, but uh, hopefully rectified now. Um, but the whole idea was you know, this still exists within your house and then you connect this up into their cloud system so you've got a clear boundary there. Um, obviously for uh, automation of the other systems then you're already in the web anyway, but you've still got to use these types of services to do it. And you still end up with Lots and lots of potential apps, some that may connect, some that may not, or these services that may connect or may not. There's no real one easy way of doing it. Um, however, there are other solutions for when you're in this ecosystem, which is to get rid of the reliance on so many apps to control the devices and maybe use one. And this is one way of solving it within the Android system. And there are a series of suppliers out there, and one of them's actually in the room, Philip, sitting over there, okay, um, who supply basically what is a, new, a hub for the home. Okay, to connect to lots of the devices that you've got and then can provide a cloud-based access to allow you remote access to the device. Uh, there we go. That's one of those boxes. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, um, and th these, are, th these, are quite these are great because you don't then have to have a whole myriad of apps. If you're in an ecosystem where you don't want to be working with Apple and HomeKit, and I can completely understand that, having, a, having one way and another a different hub, an alternative, if you like, to the Apple TV, is a good way uh, of being able to access and manage your devices without needing that myriad of different things. Um, and there are, a, uh, there are a few of these on the market. Uh, the n one comes with a little blue hub, and it's got uh, uh, a nice, okay, easy-to-use graphical app that contains uh, also automation and, and much better automation features than Apple currently have built in. Okay, so I prefer, uh, prefer that at the moment. Um, I say Apple have got to improve. They haven't done for a couple of years. Well, the n has actually been improving over the last couple of years, and that's great to see. Um, and so there are more of these coming on the market. I think you'll hear more of them about CES this year as well. I've seen lots more coming on, some with touch screens, some without, etc. Um, and so this is one way of getting rid of that problem with all those apps. And then a lot of these also provide that whole remote access through their own app. Um, but in terms of the out-of-the-box for the three that we're talking about, again, Apple kind of wins that one. It's getting a bit repetitive, isn't it? A bit broken record by now, unfortunately. Um, so let's talk about voice control. Voice control. Okay, so this is where it gets dangerous. So HomeKit has Hey Siri. Okay, Hey Siri. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for listening to me. All right, that's mine listening. That proves that that's on. Um, um, I've turned it on for the lecture, nothing else. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is an expression. I don't know how many people go around in life putting the word hey on the beginning of every sentence they say when they're addressing people. Hey, Julie. Hey, Philip. Hey, Freya. I, d I don't know how many times we do that. And it also invokes you into a way of talking, a way of speaking. That word hey gets you into a certain way of saying something. It seems very kind of jolly and joyful. But you might be angry. Siri. You, you know, you might not be very pleased. And I, you know, this whole putting this word on the front 
you know, you also train your device using that. I don't know if anyone's got an Apple device. When you set it up, it goes, can you say, hey, Siri, at me in various different ways so that I know when you're saying it. Now, this is part of their security so that they recognize when you've said it. But it also trains the device to recognize your voice, particularly with that inflection. Because you're always going to say it sort of in the same way. So you can't really say it in an angry way. Okay, which means that if you are a bit more angry and you don't say, hey Siri, in the beginning of your sentence, but you press the button and then you shout at the device, it's useless. Completely and utterly useless. Because you basically have to say this to get your inflection right so that it can tell what you're saying. I don't know if this is part of the reason behind why the HomePod, which is their new speaker with a microphone to compete with all the rest, has been delayed. Because possibly they're having to deal with the fact that so far they've trained everyone to speak with the same inflection which is a bit like telling everyone to hold their phone in the same way because they built the antennas wrong, right? You know, history there for you, <laughs> okay? But yeah, so oh, I think this is limited. It, I, it doesn't understand me some of the time, and I find that really frustrating, particularly when you've had a bad day, et cetera. I just find it's not, it doesn't quite you know, get there as good. And, and this is where Alexa does come in, because at least Alexa is a name, so you can say it in many, many different ways. You're not putting a hay on the front of it, okay? So Alexa for me is much more powerful, much more responsive, much faster as well in terms of uh, a voice assistant. And I think Amazon have really got the lead here uh, on the other two. So you can see what's coming here. We've got a difference in the outcomes. Um, but for me, Alexa is a lot more powerful. What would I, how would I rate this one? Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> so yes, finally. Finally, we have a competitor. And I, uh, that's a good thing, and that's why I guess people are finding these quite useful. Is the fact you can shout at them various things, and, they, and she tends to respond quite well to the commands that you shout well, if you've got them set up correctly. Like playing different spot, uh, Spotify playlists, buying things on Amazon, obviously works flawlessly. Okay, but you know, in terms of that, actually, the the, the, the Echo has got the edge here. The Alexa has got the edge here, um, and I'd like to see you know others improve around that kind of area. So that's kind of where we've got to, and unfortunately it's a bit of a whitewash in a certain direction at the moment. And I'm sorry for anybody in the room who doesn't like that bit, but it, that's the way that I've looked at it and it's turned out. Um, but all of them suffer from a fundamental problem, in the fact that they all promise homes of the future. Now we know what a home of the future is, for anyone who's old enough to remember the Jetsons. Okay, that's kind of the home of the future, you know, you even have bits of it in Star Trek. Yes, it's voice control, etc. But the problem is, is that we don't build homes like that. We build homes, right? Um, sorry, well, how do we control this currently? How do we control our li uh, light bulb currently? Yeah, a switch, right? And this is our fundamental problem in this ecosystem, is the f humble light switch, right? So as good as we can get, if my parents visit, which they are next week, and they come to my house, how do they turn any of the lights on? Okay, because the, what they'll do is they'll go to the wall, find the switch, which is on, and wonder why the light isn't on. Of course, the switch is on because if it isn't, the light bulb isn't powered. And without the light bulb being powered, it can't respond to a home command, basically. So they then switch the light off, and the light still isn't on. So they then switch the light back on again, hopefully. And maybe it will switch on, and maybe it won't, depending on who's the manufacturer. And this is the fundamental problem. And also, we can't get rid of this problem because of how our houses are wired, fundamentally. You can't just take this off the wall and replace it with a smart switch. It cannot be done due to the fact that we've only got one wire to the switch in our houses. The British houses are wired with the positive wire. Don't ask me why it's the positive wire. I've no idea why it's not the, the, the return wire. But it's the positive that goes to the switch, 240 volt in the back of here. You turn the switch on, it connects that 240 volt round to the light bulb. And then the negative return comes out of the light bulb. So you don't have a return on the back of your switch. You only got positive. So you can't put anything else in here other than a switch. You can't put a smart switch on that's always on and then press a button for it to send a signal to something. You can't do that. Okay, the switch is done. Okay, and it supplies the positive to your light. So this, this is a problem in the fact that we can't actually replace these even though there are products available on the market. You can look at the Philips Hue, for example, here. Okay, and mostly they come as bulbs, as I said, that you plug into your lamps uh, and then you can control them using an app. And you can get the switches for them. Okay, um, by the way, the bulbs, I'll give you some price ranges here. The bulbs, are those are currently on £25 for the pair. Okay, the switch, 20 quid, which is a bit more expensive than the 30p you get them from in B&Q. Okay, and that's basically for a switch that will do dimming and on and off. Um, 
But again, you know, it has to be wireless. It runs off a battery because you can't actually wire it into the wall. Okay, um, because you can't. Um, you haven't got enough capability. So. The, the, how you tend to control these, though, if you want to loop them into your home automation systems, this is how it works with all of them, is you need some form of thing that communicates with the bulbs, be it something that's already got the right hardware in, then drop, drop that on the floor, something that's already got the right hardware in to communicate them, or some other piece of gateway hardware that communicates with the bulbs, and then you scan the code on that in the Apple ecosystem, and it communicates with the bulbs. But still, you've got that problem of the switch. You still need to either tell it to switch on or you need to tell your parents that there's an app. Um, and I find those switches at £19 quite expensive right, to do your whole house. Um, however, there is a, a newcomer into this market recently. Uh, when I say recently, I mean April this year. Newcomer into this market. I don't know if anyone has seen this. IKEA have decided to enter this market, uh, uh, the home automation market. Um, that's why I lift up my thing. Drop that on the floor. So they've entered with, you know, you can buy a bulb and you can buy the switch. Um, what's different about these? Um, one, they're cheaper than the Philips kit, which is quite nice. Um, so the switches are only, uh, well, the switches are start off about 12 for the on off one and go to 15 for this one. Now, this one that I've got here is actually connected to that bulb over there in that lamp. There we go. Um, so wireless control. Um, which means that you can stick this on the wall. Now, what I do with this is stick a bit of Velcro on the back, and then you can just stick it on various Velcro points on the wall and carry it around with you, which is great for you know parents who just want to bash a big button. There we go, big power button on off, and then just I, I basically just put a blanking plate on the wall where the switch used to be and stick this on top of it with a piece of Velcro. Okay, easiest way of dealing with that problem. Um, what I quite like about this kit actually, which is different to the Philips kit is that you can do the multi they've built them all with multiple color spectrums. So I don't know if any of you have upgraded to LED bulbs in your house. I hope you all have, okay? But if you have, you've been, probably been to the shop and experienced this whole shock of warm white, cool white, 6,400, what, what? I mean, I always wanna buy a bulb. It used to be so simple. You went in and you bought the one that fitted in your lamp and you had a rating on how powerful it was that was in watts. And now you've got suddenly it's in thousands of things and I don't know what any of them mean, and suddenly there's now different temperature. I don't really know, and you get it home, and you put it in, and you're just like, oh, it's gone. Oh, have we got it? Come on. Oh, it's gone a bit kind of yellowish. I don't really like that color. Oh, damn it, now that's what that color looks like in my home, does it? Or it's gone, oh, it's too blue, too bright, too blue, right? Which is the, you know, another problem. You might have come, uh, come across that one when buying them. So it makes it complicated. So as you can see, IKEA have solved that problem by actually making the bulbs that do the whole color spectrum. Okay, so you can then change them off of the remote. So I, I quite liked that whole idea. Uh, that one over there is 15 quid, which actually when you compare it to normal LED bulbs at about seven for a decent one, four for the cheap ones, but now you've got all three color spectrums. That's not actually that bad. Bearing in mind they've just increased the amount of functionality in them. So in terms of a solution to that fundamental problem of the switches, the, the, the brand that thought about it, fundamentally, actually IKEA, they sell the kits with the switches in, which is great, and the, the cheaper switches that are just on off are much, much cheaper. Um, but that still doesn't answer my question. I've spent half an hour rambling at you without answering this question about Christmas lights. Um, so this really got me thinking. Um, a while back when I was looking at these ecosystems and I realized that I had quite a lot in my house already that could be communicated with but none of it was compatible with any of these systems yet and so you've got you know this kind of light uh, well it doesn't matter what that is but you know can either connected to Philips or it connected to your this is the IKEA gateway and I've got a lots of other devices that uh, that, uh, that could potentially be controlled one of the uh, and these are being controlled for me I'm using HomeKit Okay, to control these. Um, and one of the devices that I thought would be nice to control is Christmas lights, because I don't know if anyone else has the problem of you always get a multi-block at Christmas that ends up behind something with all the lights plugged into it. By the time you stack all the presents or whatever on top of it, every night crawling underneath the tree to turn the tree off, does your back in, right? Okay, so how do I actually con you know, control these Christmas lights? And it turns out that the answer is a Raspberry Pi. And this is where we get a bit interesting because now you can see I've got a bit of confusion in my ecosystem because I've got Apple HomeKit, which we think is probably very proprietary and closed. And I've got a Raspberry Pi, which is, if you haven't seen one before, if you've never seen one, it's a portable, really small size computer. I've got a three in the room, four in the room. Okay, there's one here and there's three others that you can't see. Okay, that are doing various things. Um, yeah, well, I'll show you them later. But there's one sitting here if you want to come and have a look at this one. 
Um, and the point about these is these are meant to be the cheap computers for people to be able to program and do various things on. Um, and what's really nice about them is that plenty of people have produced kind of circuit diagrams of how to connect a Raspberry Pi to, this is a red, green, blue uh, uh, LED strip using a couple of transistors. So if you're confident with a very small amount of soldering, you know, then you can get a 12 volt, 5 volt, 3 volt system, all working, dimmable, controllable, etc., all off of a Raspberry Pi. And because you've got 40 header pins, GPIOs, you can get five or six strips and different lighting systems all off of one if you're okay to wire them in a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's really quite cool. So I started playing with this. Uh, and then I thought, well, okay, so now I can turn things on and off on my Pi. But how do I turn them on and off using HomeKit? How do I get all that great stuff of HomeKit, having that display, that app, that automation, all the rest of it with this? So what's this link look like? So I did a bit of searching around the web, and I found this HomeBridge, which calls itself HomeKit for the impatient. Okay? HomeKit for the impatient being, you've probably got devices that are not yet supported by HomeKit. This is the way of getting them supported by HomeKit until they're released with support by HomeKit. Okay, and then I looked on the website for this, and this is a software package you can install on a Raspberry Pi. And I looked on the website for the plugins that you can get for HomeKit, and basically HomeKit bridges it to Apple's HomeKit. And if you see in the top left-hand corner, there are 874 of them as of last night, plugins for HomeKit. Apple have inadvertently created another ecosystem. Even though you think that theirs is tied down and locked down, this one is absolutely thriving. So I took a look into this, and you can do various searches. SkyQ, if anyone's got one of those boxes, there you go, a remote that works with HomeKit, okay, for, for controlling your SkyQ kit. Bravia TV, yep, got that one. Basically anything that's got a wireless device in it or some kind of Ethernet connection, there's probably a HomeKit plugin for it, which is great. So I want to control the LEDs off of my Raspberry Pi. Okay, so I need GPIO. Pi GPIO 183. Yeah, that's a thriving community if I've ever seen one. Okay, so yeah, pick the right one. Okay, wow. Uh, there's a lot there, but maybe I'll play around with it and have a go and see what I can get to. And so that became the kind of the solution to my problem, was this, this amazing little HomeKit library. And there's even an app now that you can install on Android and iPhone, where if you get a de facto Raspberry Pi from the factory installed with a default card, so you don't have to do any of that, you link it to your network at home, fire up the app, connect that to the Pi, and it will install HomeKit and manage it for you from the app. So you don't even need to be tech anymore to take advantage of 874 connections, which I think is amazing. And they're constantly building. And then I found this connection, the IKEA one. Because actually, IKEA didn't release HomeKit support or Alexa support until November this year. And they still haven't released Google Home. That just shows that ecosystem. Sorry, I put it to bed. They still haven't released Google Home. Um, but they've released HomeKit and Alexa support. But I've had the IKEA kit for four or five months. And the reason for that is because IKEA, there's a Homebridge plugin for it. Great. That came out in April. It came out three days after IKEA released the kit in their shops. Three days later, after it all been released in the shop, there was a plugin that worked. All oh, the IKEA kit was in HomeKit. Straight away, three days later, someone in the community had done it. And then I kind of got into this and I thought, well, that's great. Someone in the community really knows how to work the IKEA kit and has kind of hacked into it. It says down here that it uses the libcoap protocol to communicate. The gateway, the thing that I showed you, this box here, communicates using this protocol. It turns out if you open the IKEA app on your phone, the Tradfire app, and you, and you go into the terms and conditions, there's licensing. And they have to give credit to the open source library that is libcoap because that's what they use to do all the communication. It's great, they're, they're in an open ecosystem. The gateway is actually using an open library in order to talk to the bulbs and do all of its communication. That's how come it was easy to implement. And then at the, at the end of October, just before they released their new gateway firmware that had the HomeKit integration in it by um, in native, they sent this email to the community. That's shocking. Isn't that great? Turns out IKEA actually were using all of that stuff. They were actually using the Python TradFi library to test their own HomeKit implementation. So they're using all the open source libraries in order in-house to actually test everything with anyway. 
So they patched them all to do this security update and then had to simply let the community know this is how it now works to do better security. Which is basically, this is basically saying this is what Apple HomeKit is. So if you go back to my security document, Apple HomeKit, this is kind of how it works. So if you read the two and put them alongside each other, they look very similar. Okay, so they've improved the open source library at the same time and then said to the community in Homebridge, just make sure that if you still want your stuff to work, we're not supporting it, we're advising you. Don't ring us up and ask us for help on it, but we're at the same time not hiding it. And I thought, well, that's really great of a manufacturer to be like that because they're kind of implementing this kind of, they're doing a little bit more openly. I found out what open libraries they were using in-house in Sweden to develop this stuff with, the same as what I'm using at home, it turns out. Okay. Um, open source, open, open platforms. Yep. Um, and so it, it's not completely open in terms of its support, but looking at it in terms of what it's using, uh, with the software it's using, the communication standards, I was really pleased for that. And yes, I've had IKEA working with HomeKit since April, but they finally released the native support for the community, but using the community in order to d develop that, which I thought was really nice. It's a really different story, and I was so glad to see that email on the community, actually from the, the team. And so that kind of brings me to the end of that. But the main, the main thing to, th uh, I'll just go back to this other one. Actually, let's go back there. The main thing to think about here is even though I started out, and you may be thinking a home kit's that lockdown, proprietary, non-extensible system. Actually, using something like HomeKit and a simple Raspberry Pi that's not actually that expen expensive, not actually that hard to use, we've suddenly got it that we can do pretty much anything and control a lot of legacy devices as well. Um, so. I'll leave it there, but before I do, obviously, we've got to try this, haven't we? Um, so in order to do this, let's see how much works. Wish me luck, everybody. Right, let's see if I can get this working. Are you listening to me? There we go. Spotlight off. Thank you. Uh, projector off. That may be see, didn't listen to me, did you, Siri? Projector off. Right. Anything that's got a network interface is suddenly your friend. Okay, that's gone. That wasn't a power cut, by the way. If you look at the projector over there, it's got the red lamp on it. Okay, I didn't cut its power. I actually turned it off using the proper switch offset mechanism. Um, and then what else have we got? Final one. Hey Siri, let's get festive. You going to do that? Oh no, he's trying to set it up. See what I mean by Siri? It's brilliant, isn't it? Automation. Let's try that one. There you go. So yeah, uh, and that's a scene as well. Um, so yeah, all plugged in Raspberry Pi is all controllable. Anything with an Ethernet or a wireless is now your friend. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dave. That's very jazzy, and very <laughs> festive. Um, are there any questions for Dave from the room? Yeah, if you could wait for the mic. And <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Freya, I've turned your spotlights off. It's a really simple <laughs> question. Where's the rest of the Raspberry Pis? Where's the rest of the Raspberry Pis? Um, so there's one there. There's actually one in that cupboard. Um, and the one in that cupboard controls the projector system in the ODI when it's not being controlled by my voice. Uh, and there's one out in the other server room which actually controls the projectors. And there's one there. Um, there isn't one in there because my, my, my box, my one of these is at home. So this is actually just an empty box. <laughs> but, you know, there is one inside here, which is the N-Cube, actually. So it is a Raspberry Pi inside that you've developed. I didn't want to reveal that just in case people didn't want to know, but you know, I opened it up <laughs> and it's a Raspberry Pi inside, which in fact is, the, is one of them. Because uh, Philip's been kind enough to send me a couple of their, their prototypes for testing. So that's one of them um, sitting there. Um, have you thought of adding the Amazon voice recognition to the Pi to, co to get around the Siri? voice recognition problems? Um, yeah, oh, this, is, this is now come on. Fine, thank you, Siri, finally. It responded. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, this is also wired in. There's another pie there. Uh. Okay. <laughs> That's where the other one is. <laughs> um, no, I haven't had a look at that yet in terms of on the pie. One of the main reasons for that that I haven't is because I'm not a greatest fan of something being static like this myself because I think you should be able to control it any on your phone, good, Personally, I like using the watch, because that's even better, because I know it can't be permanently listening, because it will just kill the battery, basically. So it only ever listens when the watch face is on, so you know when it's listening, which I think is quite nice. So I actually prefer it on the watch, because then you can be anywhere, 
and, and be like, turn that on, turn that off, is that on, etc. as opposed to having to shout at a room or a Raspberry Pi that's probably buried in the ceiling because, I mean, I, I, I'm not, a, believe it or not, this is not very good for me today, I'm not a great fan of wires. I don't like them, I think they make the place look messy. I like hiding things and making it look neat, but then still having control over it. And that's the kind of the point of why Raspberry Pi's like this one, which is Raspberry Pi Zero with Wi-Fi on it. I mean, look at the size of that, if you haven't seen one before. That's communicating with the Wi-Fi network internally and powering these. You know, um, but yes, really tiny, and I've got six sets of strips at home. But in terms of the talking to the thing, I prefer taking it with you as opposed to shouting at it. I'm not going to get a home pod. <laughs> Definitely not. Jenny. Quite a boring question, but the, with the IKEA switch, yeah. so do you take the switch from room to room? And if you had more than one bulb, like, how does that know which bulb? So you pair them to the bulbs. You can pair up to 20 bulbs per switch. So you can take it from room to room? You can do, but the, the problem is, is you can't tell it which bulb to control. So it can either control 10 or 1. You can't go that one and that one with one switch. So you, like in a current house, it's the same thing, right? So you can't have one switch that's on and off and go, this t when I press it this time, I want that bulb to turn on. That, that, that's not a function that they build in. But you can buy lots of these and then regroup your bulbs into different groups and go, well, this currently controlling that one, that one, and that one. Or you can regroup them later on and go, well, actually, let's make it different. Which is actually quite nice because once you wire your house, you can't do that with a switch on the wall where you can't suddenly separate. When you build, you might knock through a room or you might divide a room. It's really difficult then to separate the electrics for the switches because it's been put in as one room, whereas at least with this system, you can put up to 20 bulbs on a switch or remove them from a switch. But the switches talk directly with the bulb. I haven't got the gateway with me here today. Uh, gateway's still sitting at home. They talk directly with the bulb. So you pair them with the bulb. But you can buy as many of these as you like, as many bulbs as you like, and then decide on how you make your house and how it works. But yeah. So if all the bulb manufacturers use this, if all the bulb manufacturers use the same protocols, yeah. then it wouldn't be locked into all the different systems. Now this is interesting because IKEA used the same protocol as Philips. Now they've upgraded, they've updated their kit to work with the Philips hub. So you don't have to buy the, the IKEA gateway, you can actually pair all their bulbs to the Philips hub so you can have one less piece of kit in your house. So this is again their tactic of going, look, we've chosen a protocol which is actually cross compatible with Philips. So we've made sure it works with Philips. The other way around, not so sure. Okay, but it's a, yeah, really interesting. So this is what, yeah, IKEA for me are kind of, you know, they've also made it a lot cheaper. They've taken an open approach to it. It's quite a nice thing at the moment. I'm sounding a bit like a salesman for IKEA at the moment. <laughs> I'm aware of that. <laughs> Peter. Oh, oh yeah. Hello, uh, thank you for that. That's um, right. So just in terms of the home bridge, um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of functionality there that probably goes uh, beyond what Apple had necessarily envisaged. Has there been much of a response from them on, or any response from them or indication of how they feel about that ecosystem? Well, what's really interesting is that when they initially released the HomeKit platform, right, you had to have a physical chip, security chip, inside your devices to talk to HomeKit. Now, at their keynote this year, in June, whatever their software keynote is rather than the hardware keynote. They proudly announced on stage that they're getting rid of the requirement for the hardware chip and now you can do the encryption in software. All of a sudden HomeKit became viable as a solution to actually implement and do for consumers because now you don't actually need the chip in there to become supported by Apple. You can actually do it in software, which is how come IKEA are able to upgrade their gateways because they don't have the chip in them. So it's actually done in software, and I'm probably, I don't know what they're running underneath, maybe Homebridge. <laughs> they're already running Co-app, which is an open source thing, so what are they running underneath to make it work with well, HomeKit? I mean, maybe it's HomeKit. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so... The ODI HQ lights, anyone, anyone who's ever worked here at the office late at night knows that the lights here are motion sensitive mm -hmm. and you have to jump up and down a lot to yeah. get them to turn back on when they're turned off. Yeah. Can we make them voice activated? I'll happily help. <laughs> <laughs> I've started with this room. <laughs> well, we, should, we should say cat, turn the lights on. Yeah, we, we've got the ceiling cats out there if anyone hasn't <laughs> seen ceiling cat looking at you the entire time. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I've done a little bit with this room just for a bit of fun today. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's perfectly possible to do, but you just have to be careful with getting into the realms of 240 volt. 
And that's what I do dare say. Most of the LED bulbs operate off 12 volts, so you're much safer, right, in terms of that kind of circuitry. But you just, you know, I wouldn't advise going home and rewiring a 240 40 volt socket in order to do this. Start with much less if you're keen on getting that done. There's lots of guides online. I can give you links if you want as well um, to how to get started with it all. I've got one. This might be a bit of a Luddite question, but um, sorry, Peter, I know you don't like the term Luddite. Um, <laughs> when's enough enough, Dave? Are you, are you uh, happy with where you are in your house and your parents not being able to turn your lights off? Well, they can now. That's the point. OK. That's the, that's the kind of point. Is that's what I've been aiming for, is that the usability, the solving that fundamental problem has been a really important step in actually doing that with the mm. house. Um, as opposed to, you know, so when I migrated most into over to LED bulbs now, I've done it with the IKEA kit as opposed to a mid-ground of something that you don't really know what colour it's going to turn out at. Um, so, it, it, you know, for me it was about providing the flexibility, the new technology, but also the same fundamental interface. And I think that that's the key actually here. So, you know, enough is enough. I, I, I've got plenty of stuff working with it. OK. And actually, can you ask that question to my other half who loves all the Christmas lights? She's <laughs> like, I want another set. I want another set. And I'm just like, no, no, I don't want more sets of Christmas lights. So maybe it's not me you should be asking <laughs> in this particular case. Um, I'll get home tonight. There'll be another set of Christmas lights turned up. She'll be like, I want that set there. No. <laughs> We've got two questions uh, from Twitter. So Stuart asks, what is the environmental impact of each system? How many power devices, including the cloud, need to be on to switch on a light bulb? This is true. Yeah, no, great question. And as you can see with the, when I did the, the Alexa and the Google Home kind of one, the number of squares is basically a whole other device. And you're also relying on all of them working. So you're relying on the manufacturer's link and their web service still working. So if they go away, do you suddenly end up with half the bulbs in your house not working? So it's not just about you know, environmental impact of all those manufacturers existing. Right? It's also about the longevity as well. If any of those blocks start disappearing in the other ecosystem, suddenly you can't actually turn a bulb on in your own room? That seems very weird to me. The apps are not compatible with the next version of Android. Hang on a minute, now I can't turn it on again. What's going on? I mean, th this is why actually the Apple ecosystem where that line is, it's all within your house. You don't have to go to the cloud, and that's what's key. You don't have to use Siri if you don't want to. And half the time, I don't, as you can see. That iPad or that sits on the side at home in the best place, and you can obviously move it around, is the quickest way of interacting with everything. And so I don't actually have to leave the house, and none of the messages leave the house in that case. So the environmental impact there and the sustainability is much better because they're all talking that protocol, which, you know, if Apple got rid of it, there's suddenly a big problem with all those devices that have been sold as opposed to one manufacturer gone out of business. You know, so, so for me, the environmental impact, I imagine, is, again, I'm afraid, with Apple, mm. because it's your choice over how much of it you use as opposed to you have to use it all to make it work. Um, and one more from Harry Wood, who is very observant. Oh, hi, Harry. <laughs> and the, uh, the quality must be pretty good on the live screen stream because he says, your jumper lights are flashing in interesting sequences. That's all programmable on the pie in your pocket, I suppose. Um, I haven't done that far because that's enough is enough. Because <laughs> I would not recommend doing this. I mean, I'm carrying around a battery pack to power the pie. I mean, don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to do that. That's just a demo. <laughs> OK? Um, you know, I'll just plug it back in the normal battery pack after I've finished and have an on-off switch. This is too far. This is just something I thought I'd put in for fun just because it's possible. Code signal. No, it's whatever the jumper decides to do because the circuitry is still in the jumper of what the lights do. Basically, there's nothing clever on there. That's just power, ground and three volt. That's just, just power. Jumper. That's just power. It's just in the jumper. Like a jumper. Yeah, <laughs> it's whatever the jumper did. I didn't know that when I bought it. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're just about out of time. Um, thank you so much, Dave. A round of applause, for Dave. Thank you. Um, we have broken up now for Christmas. Uh, we'll be joined again in January, on January the 12th, uh, by Anya from, uh, I forgot my surname, sorry. Anya um, Cauldron? Cauldron, yeah, yep. um, from Open Data Charter, talking about open data leadership in government. So join us then. Off.